So I think uh, we've been sort of involved in uh, in working together on this, not least in the Royal Society of Bi uh, the Biologist uh, article that we wrote on uh, how we teach. Um, but uh, I think probably one of the reasons that have been less engaged uh, with the Dry Labs Real Science um, is because um, I, I'm an ecologist. Um, so sort of my, my, my field is we're, we're facing very similar problems, um, but potentially some quite different solutions to those. Um, and all of the sort of, I think one of the things that I'd like to say, and I imagine this is sort of just agreed uh, generally, is that whilst there's lots of uh, opportunities for doing uh, some really interesting stuff, um, I was sort of quite disappointed throughout the summer in that fundamentally um, we can do things, but nothing is, uh, nothing is going to replace field work. And fundamentally that experience is, is going to be a little bit less. Um, so I'd like to discuss uh, two things that I've, we've been running in Hull, uh, one which is, it definitely fits that maxim, and one in which I feel actually I've improved uh, the provision of practical work as a result of having to reflect on, on, on the limitations of, um, of the pandemic. Um, so the first one uh, that we're going to discuss um, is attempting to provide immersive virtual field trips through 360 videos. Um, this work is uh, as part of the work being done by uh, CEPA, um, which is uh, Erasmus uh, EU grant looking at uh, integrating 360 video into higher education. Um, and it's quite fortuitous that that sort of started uh, about six months before the pandemic hit um, and has now obviously become uh, massively relevant across a, a number of different fields. Um, so I just thought I'd start with an example of a 360 video, not related to any kind of uh, any kind of field work, but uh, just something um, that I quite enjoyed. So the training for this was done out in Florence, um, and uh, we were given the opportunity to test out the 360 videos and what they were capable of doing. So the really interesting thing about the 360 video is obviously. Um, different to a normal video in that I can start to click and drag um, and I can pick and choose where I want to look within the video. Um, and obviously this, uh, if you were to load this up onto your phone, um, you'd have uh, an option at the bottom of doing it like a virtual headset and the gyroscope in your phone would respond um, to the movements of your head and you'd be able to look around for the video based on, based on just your head. Um, so uh, uh, this sort of uh, related to, I was really excited about this opportunity um, because I, I've been really interested for a long time um, about inclusive holidays um, and doing videos like this. So for example, getting to the top of the cathedral uh, for someone who would not have the um, ableness to, to, to get up there themselves. Um, related to, to some of my experiences being on holiday. Um, so I was really excited about this opportunity. I wanted to do a 360 video of the climb up the, up the tower at Frenzy for a really long time. So this, this is what it looks like. Um, this has been uploaded into YouTube. YouTube's great because it has the capacity to deal with 360 videos. Um, you can upload really long segments. Um, and it's all in all quite a handy little tool. Um, so that's, uh, that's just a quick idea. There are some really interesting, um, so this is the website for uh, CEPA 360, um, which is the team uh, across Europe that are working on creating sensible materials to help people create their own 360 videos. Um, there's a load of information here on what video cameras you should use, uh, guidance on shooting, um, and how to edit and create a final platform. Um, I would say, to be honest, although there was uh, a set of training materials, it's really, really easy to just get out into the field and start shooting um, and, and just sort of capturing stuff in. Um, it's actually, I think, much easier to capture the footage 
um, than it is to edit it and put it into something that makes sense in the context of uh, an educational resource or educational experience. Um, so I think that this is sort of, uh, and I think this was, for me, was what one of the sort of the key barriers um, with the experience was you can get out and you can shoot a lot of footage, um, but then turning that into something meaningful was quite difficult. Um, so the best platform that I've found so far for this um, is a field trip that we use for our uh, module on management. And so this is a final year module uh, for students who have done um, sort of extensive time with ecology and field work. They should be quite comfortable with it. Um, and this is, uh, it's not related to an assessment. Um, it's a field work experience about getting some idea of uh, what it's like to be in the field of wildlife management, which is quite different to what we do elsewhere, which has very much an ecological science focus. And this is this is very applied. Um, so this is the format that we decided to use for this. Um, and this is a, a web app called Story Maps, um, which you can get on the Art, online ArcGIS uh, website. Um, so it's really nice because what it allows you to do is it allows you to blend sort of website, um, media, and then you can integrate and embed those 360 videos that we had before so you get something that looks like this like quite a standard website um, and then we can really sort of start to engage the students with place and i think this is a really important part of field work um, so we can provide some context on on the habitat that we're going to um, and then we can zoom in on the specific site within the UK. So I apologise for any of you guys who feel a bit car sick with this. Um, but so we can sort of see and we can we can look at the context of the site in a global one and then at a sort of at a county level. Um, and we can include a little bit of information about the website here. And the students basically just scroll down um, and eventually they get down to access. And here we have the 360 videos which have been embedded. Um, so the students, we have a little bit of information on it and then they can turn it into full screen. Um, so I think we're, we're losing a significant amount of quality, I imagine, from you guys, from the guys on your end, because this is being streamed into my laptop and then out to you guys via Zoom. Um, hopefully the quality is just pinged a bit better for you guys now. Um, but we can see basically what we did was take a series of vignettes um, of Alistair talking from the, the, the various sites. Uh, so that's Alistair Ward, he's our head of department um, and uh, my, my co-partner on the uh, on the module. And you can see me in my kit here, uh, my very, very outrageous field kit. Um, and so Alice, what Alice is doing here is he's just talking about the different ways that we go about um, looking for signs of red deer in a habitat um, and basically what happens is all of this training is put together so that students can go into a go into a site um, and they can basically complete a habitat impact score uh, for red deer which is a, a management uh, tool that they might use for for something like this a, 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 a standard moorlands habitat for the uk um, so the students can go through this, they, they can access it in their own, uh, at their own time. And obviously that, that primary advantage, um, there are various points where Alistair goes, look over there or look at your feet or all of that sort of stuff. Um, and it's just that little bit more immersive than it would be if, if we were controlling the video for them. Um, obviously these would also work if it wasn't the video, so that, that's... Uh, uh, and we've got another video here on how we can tell different fecal piles. So looking to identify deer on site by, by, by the dropping. Um, and then uh, just as a sort of, I, I did this just for this session, you can show you can embed quite a lot of things. So there's an embed tool within uh, story maps um, that you can embed loads of different stuff. Um, and so this is a Mentimeter that's embedded in there. Um, we can zip through the various bits and pieces like we would lecture they can answer the, they can answer questions um, in their own time 
um, and make it sort of interactive for you to embed stories. Anything that you would normally be able to embed into a website, um, you can embed into story maps, which makes it an immensely powerful tool. Um, and for what it's worth, putting this website together, uh, or this, this story maps together, once you had all of the materials ready, took me no longer than two hours from first opening up story maps to, to creating this. Um, I think it is, uh, the guided user interface for this is so straightforward. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, I think, I think it's a really interesting and, and, and helpful resource that, that we could use going forward. So I think anything field based, uh, the integration of these, of these maps would be a really helpful thing. So a sort of quick reflection on those. Um, in terms of 360 videos, there is a cost. Um, so my 360 camera was provided by the CEPA 360 project. So that was funded by Erasmus. Um, basically, there were four or five trial departments within Hull and various other universities across Europe. And we were basically just given a load of cameras. Um, and we tried lots of different cameras between us so that we got some idea of what the best ones were. Um, I really like the GoPro. Um, it's very straightforward. The main problem with the GoPro is getting it from your camera into YouTube is a faff. It took me longer to get the footage from the camera into YouTube than it did for me to make that entire story, uh, story maps uh, website. Um, it's it's and these files are huge. Um, so each 360 uh, video is is tens of gigabytes um, for just you know five minutes or so. So uh, if you've got it in 4K, which I think is really what you need in order for it to have the proper immersive uh, immersiveness uh, immersion. It's a best immersion. Uh, we'll go with immersion. Um, there's also potentially a uh, cost to the students. So realistically, once it's on YouTube, most laptops should be able to handle it relatively easily. Um, however, we do have, um, uh, if the students wanted to use it as a VR headset, that's really expensive. Now, I don't think there's any need to do that. I think they could do if they wanted to. And we're looking at the University of Hull um, about whether we have a couple of those on campus so that when we come back, students can loan them out and use them. Um, but I think the interface with YouTube is, is, is relatively straightforward. Um, as I said, the editing software, I think particularly for GoPro, is really clunky um, and what I did was I did most of my video editing on YouTube and it requires uh, about five or six hours to upload a relatively short video up into up into YouTube but once it's there you can edit it quite well you can chop and change and cut different bits out um, and I really like the sort of bit the the way that we've settled in terms of having these short videos paired together in a format like story maps by do it relatively straightforward in your learning environment through the sort of the rich text, uh, rich content editor. Um, and uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's, uh, I, th I think for me, that was the biggest learning curve and that, that was the greatest difficulty. Um, the CEPA 360 group are working on a 360 video editor and player called For Vista. Um, I'm not quite sold on it yet. It's one of the big outputs of the grant is, is, is this thing. I think it's probably too early really to start using it. So if you were wanting to create something, you know, seeing as it looks like we're now going to be in lockdown until um, the second week of March, um, or whatever it is, um, you know, if you're wanting to put together a um, story maps field trip now, um, I would recommend getting a GoPro upload it into YouTube, edit it, and then paste it in something like Story Maps or Canvas, um, which, uh, which which should be relatively straightforward. But Vivista, you're supposed to be able to load these things in, um, and basically as the, the students engage with it, they should be able to like hover over a section and you can add information. So a number of these are being done for lab work, um, touring labs, um, and having icons related to different bits of lab equipment and quizzes can pop out related to that. That's the end point of Vista, but I don't think it's anywhere near that yet. Um, 
I think, harking back to my initial point, that this is not a replacement for field work. Um, I think it is a significant reduction in um, passing and learning outcomes um, and experience for the students compared to a normal year. Um, I think, and I think it's just something that I've had to accept. So I know that some people have created, uh, someone's recreated a uh, milk station in Minecraft, uh, which I'm sure is uh, a much better experience than this. Um, but as, as far as I'm concerned, this is fantastic and we'll use this going forward um, if a student can't make a field trip for any reason um, or they can use it as a revision resource if they want to go back to certain elements to field trip really helpful um, and we're going to create these for all of our international fit final year field trips going to New York and Brazil um, to help students uh, know what to expect in the space because I do think it is really helpful in that context of reducing student anxieties about the unknowns of field work. Um, I'm going to pop straight through into the next one which I'm going to discuss. Uh, so uh, by, by trade uh, I'm a behavioural ecologist um, so a lot of my teaching is related to animal behaviour um, and uh, Traditionally, my final year project normally consists of forcing students to watch squirrels or ducks um, and doing behaviour projects based on those. Um, they work, uh, the students get quite into it in the end, um, but uh, charismatic exotic megafauna it is not. Um, and realistically, most of the students on our zoology programme, that's what they want to work with. That's why they got into zoology and it's kind of a bit of a shame that, you know, they sort of have visions of a, of a future working with uh, mountain gorillas um, and I've got them in the local park watching mallets. Um, so, and I think this for me is an example in which my teaching has improved as a result of the pandemic um, because we had to reflect on what data sources students would be able to access from their home computers. Um, and we found that actually there is a huge resource of live stream webcams um, and pre-recorded footage of animals behaving in the wild and in captivity. It is all over the internet um, and it's good quality stuff. Um, so uh, this is one of the examples. I've got some students working on this at the moment. Uh, so this is explore.org. Um, I think there's a hundred and something webcams. Uh, of course, we ha I've, I checked this one earlier to make sure there was interesting stuff going on. Um, there was a whole herd of gazelles there uh, not 30 minutes ago, um, which is obviously stereotypical, um, absolutely typical that that's what happened. Um, let's just have a quick elephant's river is normally a good call. Um, so these are these are out in South Africa. Um, what do I say? Uh, uh, so these these are various sites across across South Africa. Um, this is the least active I've seen all of these webcams in the whole year that I've been doing these things, um, which is obviously exactly what you'd expect when you're doing uh, a presentation on it. Yeah, great. Okay, fine. Um, I'll tell you what. So it's not the right time of year. Uh, there aren't any brown bears. They're still hibernating at the moment. But this is a highlights reel from previous years. And so this is the kind of footage that we can expect students to be able to access on a regular basis. Um, so these are these are brown bears fishing on salmon um, in Alaska. Um, and there are a number of different um, data streams from the same park at different areas. Um, and you can see a number of different individuals here uh, throughout the summer. Um, and uh, this this was the webcam that really sort of uh, inspired me to, to 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 launch the project really. Um, and this is just one of many many webcams that are available. Uh, so I've created 
um, a set of shared resources um, to help people with, the, with these projects. Um, it, it's not, I mean, it's not extensive because fundamentally the projects are pretty straightforward. Um, the projects are fundamentally create, uh, I've got a list um, of data sets, data resources, um, which you guys can access. But what I'm hoping really by sharing this um, is that we can make this a bit bigger. So I've got 18 uh, various webcams from across the world, uh, looking at lots of different habitats, uh, including the, you know, the UK, um, uh, rainforest in Panama, uh, uh, aquatic and terrestrial, um, and also captive and wild. Um, so there are various different advantages and disadvantages, which I won't go into now, um, in terms of what kinds of projects. Uh, we've also supplemented these with videos from our researchers, basically of just videos of our projects. So we, you know, we have uh, hours and hours of uh, footage of oyster catchers feeding in Bailey uh, and uh, uh, beavers being released into Crockton and all of that sort of stuff. So we, we've supplemented those. Um, and basically the starting point is the students have a look through these and pick which one they think is interesting. And for me, the really exciting thing about this is we use traditional immersive ethology methods. Basically, the students spend lots of time watching animals. This is how animal behavior studies started. Uh, this is the sort of natural history of the, of the field. Um, and basically what happens is the students pick uh, a, a data stream that they're interested in and they sit and watch it for a number of days. And what we then do is, is we go through a journey as a research group. So I've got 18 students, uh, 18 final year students doing this. Um, uh, and it's, re it's really efficient um, because we all meet in groups. Um, and basically, here's the rough timeline. So basically what happens is the first week, I give them a quick talk. Here's all the data sources. This is why it's exciting. This is why it's not um, second best to my life because if it was live projects you'd be looking for the squirrels um, and this year you guys get to go and do projects online um, which is met with universal joy um, so we have the first session talking about how it's going to work and then the students basically have a couple of weeks to pick their data sources um, so they go through the data sources and they watch and they decide the thing that they're interested in uh, then they give me a quick presentation saying, this is the data source that I want to use. And this is, this is the, um, this is the kind of thing that I'm interested in. And this is sort of a starting point where we go, okay, is the quality of the data stream that they want to use? Is it good enough? Have they got a sufficient number of individuals? Um, can they actually get a project out of this? We'll, we'll get some viable data. Um, and, then we do a workshop on ethograms and ethology, um, for which I've got the shared resources here. Um, so you guys uh, can have a look at, at, at an introduction to ethology. Um, and basically what I do is I teach the students how to be an ethologist using uh, the research of, of Dame Jane Goodall. Um, so the students learn how to do uh, behavioral observations based off uh, a load of um, uh, National Geographic documentary videos of chimpanzees. Um, so there's uh, helpful resources for that there. Um, and then basically, the students use this as a model for watching and observing their species and looking to see what kinds of behaviours happen. And from that, they can generate their own hypotheses. Uh, we discuss the hypotheses, we make sure that their data is all correct. Uh, and then they go away um, and they watch even more footage um, and collect the data uh, from that. So um, in terms of uh, just some examples of the kind of projects that people are doing, uh, we've got parental care, duration and investment of African le leopards as a function of the size of the litter. So looking at two cub and one cub um, uh, family units and looking at the amount of time that the leopards spend in parental investment and how uh, split amongst different offspring. Um, European badger, uh, looking at habitat heterogeneity and origin theory, so looking at um, European badgers through uh, trail cams um, and whether how they respond to mating of those trail cams with eggs. 
Um, we've got students working on wild raccoons, um, uh, African lions in captivity and in the wild in terms of aller grooming. Um, and then one of my favourites is we are using um, Take Me Out, the TV show, to look at human mate preference decisions, um, which is just absolutely ace. Uh, one of the students wanted to use naked attraction, but we were best sold about that. Um, so, yeah, so there's, there's some really good opportunities for some really interesting projects from it. To sort of briefly, quickly wrap up, I think one of the key things is because you have less control over the data, you need to lower your expectations of what the final projects are. And I think this is something that sort of, uh, these are unlikely to be publishable. And this is much more about the student's experience and making sure that they're learning things like, um, you know, how to approach data methods, analyzing data and, and writing up, and also a lot more about managing their own time. Um, they've got a lot more independence in this than they used to do in my old project. Um, and they're really rising to that. But we need to reduce our expectations of how quality their data will be. Um, I'm going to carry on running my projects like this. Uh, I'm not going back to squirrels and ducks. I think it's great. Uh, I also think it's much more accessibility friendly um, and also it's much better on my mental health because uh, I'm not constantly having to deal with students going into uh, field work on their own um, and sending me a text saying, oh, I'm going out to the field to collect data and then not texting me when I get back. So I need to work out whether I need to send an ambulance or a search party or whatever to, to, to the to the local park. Um, and as I said before, I find it really efficient um, being able to teach all of the students with exactly the same methods at exactly the same time. And then I do most of my actual supervision by them presenting stuff to me and discussing that. Um, and they come to the sessions a lot, a lot more prepared. And I'm just noticing that they're much more engaged in it. Um, so hopefully I, I've done okay to time there. Um, but uh, any questions? Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll share the um, I'll share the link to that uh, presentation so that you guys can um, uh, so that you guys can access all of the links uh, directly. That's okay. Excellent. Thank, thanks, John. That was that was fascinating. Um, you're a mind reader because many of the questions that have popped up, you then immediately answered as as part of your presentation. Yeah. So that that was that was quite good, but. Um, the 360 cameras, there was there was a lot of talk about people getting access to them. Um, well, mm. how, how, I know you said you got through a grant, but are there other ways to get access to the, to the tech? They are expensive, but they are commercially available. So, I mean, I, I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to remember what we're, what we're talking about. I think we're talking to the team of about 400 pounds. Actually, to be honest, I'm used to an ecology project. Four hundred pounds is the entire budget for my, you know, for for my PhD. Um, because anything that you can't get from B and Q has no place in an ecology project. But um, you know, for, for so I imagine for some of you guys thinking about lab consumables and that sort of stuff, um, four hundred pounds is probably a lot more reasonable. Um, so it's, I mean, it's not something that there's a massive ceiling in terms of departmental engagement with. I'm pretty sure they're on, I'm pretty sure it was on Amazon, uh, with GoPro Max. Yeah. Uh, just well, have a quick that's look. good. Thanks. So I always, I always go through, um, fractions of antibodies. So a, a cam, one of these cameras is two antibody lots. Yeah. It's so, uh, we've, we've got 413 pounds on Amazon for a GoPro Max 360. Um, excellent oh yeah Thanks. cool there was what two other questions i'm gonna i was gonna ask you one of mine and one of um chris's the the 360 videos i assume yeah. that in the going forward in the future they're going to make like a, a good training set ready to go out to the field work and get the most out of the days yeah absolutely so it's exactly the same as the American science resources in terms of people making sure you know, these preparatory lab activities so that students, when they enter the practical, they know what it is that they're supposed to do. You know, we always hand up, hand out practical handbooks and that kind of stuff, which will be engaged with by maybe 25% of the group. Um, and I think this way just provides us with something that's just a bit more 
uh, a bit more accessible um, and uh, a bit more cool. And then you, you sort of answered that you did answer the last one that Chris put into the post, but I'll ask it again anyway because um, you talked about publication, but um, Chris said, can this generate behavioural data for publications as opposed to peer-reviewed papers? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it depends. Um, you, it's you. I think it probably depends on the uh, um, site. I'm not a very good researcher. I made I made the jump very early into education um, because that was the bit that I enjoyed. So my frame, my sort of mental framework about this was okay. How can I maximise what the students get out of this? Um, so most of the students are working on data sets of between five to twenty individuals um, across across all the various data sets. Um, which is fine for this because we're not so we're not as bothered about pseudo replication and, and and all of that kind of stuff. I think it's probably possible for people to be able to generate bigger behaviour stuff for themselves, but I think that that would rely on them sort of engaging with it and thinking it and applying their good research brain to it as opposed to my bad research brain. Does that does that make any sense whatsoever? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not quite sure yet. Just um, about. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sure that people would be able to go into this and think and, you know, you might be able to find double the number of data sources for your uh, for your focal species or you might be able to look at different species um, and increase your the quality of your data. 